morning. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? I'll tell you what, we're lacking a few this morning, but your voices are some ringing out today. I like to hear that. First thing, I didn't even have to ask you again. Praise the Lord. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord today. It's a beautiful day outside. I'll tell you what, this weather we're having here lately is just really invigorating. I'm gets me want to get up and go. Get up every morning, open up your eyes and thank the Lord. You just got two new gifts. You open up your eyes again and praise the Lord. And then we get up on Sunday morning, get ourselves ready, come into his house to worship him. Y'all want to stand up with me? And we're going to sing again. Come, now is the time to worship. everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. We are so glad to see you. For those of you who are joining us online as well, we are glad that you are with us and you are very welcome to come join us in person when you are able as well. I uh, just wanted to point out some announcements for us this morning. Um, the youth will meet tonight from 5 to 7, but it's not going to be normal. Tonight you need to bring a flashlight. So make sure that you bring a flashlight when you come tonight. I've been assured that you are not spotlighting deer or anything like that. Um, there will be Wednesday night service at 7 p.m., so please do join us for that. Uh, Veterans Coffee House will be this Thursday, October 27th from 9 to 11. So that is this Thursday, the 27th. Um, breakfast will be at 9, and they'll have guest speakers and door prizes. I have heard that, that is a great event and a great uh, 
opportunity to invite other veterans from the community. So if there's any veterans in the church, you're welcome to come to that. If you know any veterans who are in the community, please invite them to come and be a part of that as well. October 30th will be our Pastor Appreciation Day. There's a box, in the, or there will be a box in the foyer for any cards you might want to drop off for Pastor Chris and Laura. So this week you can get those and prepare those if you so desire. Um, and you can drop those off next Sunday. November 5th, from 12 to 2, there will be a ladies tea. So that'll be a fellowship and there will be door prizes. The ladies always do the funnest things, it seems like, as I look through the announcements. They're always having a social or doing a tea or, you know, the guys, we just, we don't do that. That's fine. <laughs> oh, I've been invited. Thank you so much. <laughs> but I'm going to uh, not join you and ruin your fun. Thank you, though. <laughs> uh, the... <laughs> Uh, Jesse Chief Food Pantry donations. Uh, we are, of course, still looking for donations there going into the Thanksgiving and Christmas season, so please be generous donating food. Um, choir and musicians, you know what to do. 8.45 a.m., Sunday mornings. Um, the Trunk or Treat, which will be October 29th from 12 to 2, we need more cars for that. Uh, I spoke with Erica this morning. We have several people who've signed up, but we need many more. So please, if you are able... To bring a car. If you're not able to bring your car, bring candy uh, and add that in as well uh, to what everyone else is doing. There was some confusion. The sign-up sheet for that, I've been telling you, was, was at the back of the church. It was not. It is there now. So if it was your intention to sign up and you weren't able to find the sign-up sheet, it is in the back today. So you should be able to find that. If you can't, please talk with Erica and she will get you straightened out. <clears throat> The mission team will be meeting here at the church Tuesday at noon. So Tuesday of this week, meet with Rich at noon. If you have any questions about that, you can speak with him. There was a poinsettia order form in the bulletin last week. It's not in there this week. However, I just want to point out that we would need the orders by next Sunday. They are eight seventy-five a piece. A check would be made out to Waxhaw Baptist Church, and in the memo line, you can write in honor of or in memory of this person, and that it's for the poinsettia order. So, please bring that next week. I believe those are all the announcements that were not in the bulletin as well. Yes, so the, the box, that's where your cards can go for Pastor Appreciation Day, which will be next Sunday, the 30th, when Pastor Chris is... The box was not back there, so it's a new development. If there's not a box there, just hold on to it and bring it next week, and we'll be sure to get it to Pastor Chris. Any other announcements I may have missed? All right. I would like to direct our attention to Psalm 146, 1 through 3. I know that in life... Uh, there can be times when it feels like the world is falling down around us. But particularly in the Psalms, there are very encouraging words. Our Sunday school class just completed today going through the Psalms. And this is the one that I recalled as I wanted to share one with you this morning. Psalm 146, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help and trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. So even as the world is falling apart, whether in a literal sense of the mountains are moving and falling into the sea, or if it just feels like that is going on, I wanted to remind us that God is our refuge and strength, and he is a present help in trouble. He is always with us. That's the word of encouragement I want to share with you this week. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together uh, as we start another week. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship you, to join together into community, to hear from your word. We pray that you would fill the pastor with your word to share with us and that you would open our hearts to receive it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And thank the Lord that the, the computer didn't freeze up today. So, 
Y'all stand with me and sing. standing if you can't, and uh, we're going to bring out some of the old, older songs, and how great thou art.
Have you ever been in the woods, especially early in the morning, and walking through the woods, and there's nobody but you and God, and you hear the birds singing, like the second verse said, you hear that gentle voice, and you think of God, nobody but you and him. That is a great time. How great our God is. Thank you, thank you. Turn to your neighbor behind you, the one in front of you, the one on each side of you, tell him you love him. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Children's church at the same time, the children go ahead to children's church.
You know, it never ceases to amaze me. It's difficult enough in this day's world to know exactly who Jesus is and have faith and believe. But it never ceases to amaze me that the men who walk beside him every day heard him preach, heard him teach, saw him heal, saw him raise the dead, and still did not understand exactly who he was. Men of great faith, men of godly men, still walked with him every day and did not fully understand who Jesus was. Man, I wonder what they're thinking now. Huh? <laughs> Listen to the words and not the man. Turn it up just a little bit more, please. Heard him preach and watched the crowds that gather. Amazed at how the hungry souls were fed. Saw it when the blinded eyes were open. Even watched the master raise the dead. Then they heard him crying as he prayed there in that garden. There's a cross, a crown of thorns upon his head. Those men who walk beside him, I wonder what they're thinking now. For another crowd is gathered And they're all arrayed in splendor Singing holy, holy to the land They see a million angels That only have one purpose To give all glory to the great I Am do you think they still remember how they walked away from Calvary? And let them there on Golgotha's brow. Those men who walk beside him, I wonder what they're thinking now. All but one soon died for serving Jesus. Though their hearts with fear sometimes filled with fear and doubt. <laughs> Listen, those men, they're now in heaven. I wonder what they're thinking now. For another crowd is gathered And they're all arrayed in splendor Singing holy, holy to the land They see a million angels That only have one purpose To give all glory to the great I Am do you think they still remember how they walked away from Calvary and met them there on Golgotha's brow? Those men who walked beside him, I 
wonder what they're thinking now. For another crowd is gathered, and they're all arrayed in splendor, singing holy, 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 holy to the only have one purpose to give all glory to the great I am do you think they still remember how they walked away from Calvary and left them there on Golgotha's brow those been who walk beside him I wonder what they're thinking now Those men Who walk beside him I wonder what they're thinking I can hardly wait for that day when I walk beside him. <laughs> One quick word. Uh, next Sunday, invite all your friends and as many people as you can get to come. I'm working on something that I hope comes to volition, but I would like to see if you get some of our children, if not all of them, up on stage next Sunday and sing a song for you. I understand that they sing every Sunday in Sunday school. So I think it would be nice to have them up here and sing for us. We'll put something up on the marquee up there and let them sing along with it. I'm not going to make them do it by themselves. But if, they, if, if they're willing, and I'll speak with the, the ones in powers of E at the time. But uh, again, we have Pastor Harris with us today. I want to welcome him again. Thank him for being here last week and filling in for... Preacher Chris, while he's on vacation. It has been so enjoyable this morning to be with you here during this time of worship. And your singing is good, folks. You sing good. That is good. What a wonderful opportunity we have to lift our voices in praise to our God, Amen. to worship Him. And the scriptures teach he likes that. He enjoys the praises and the worship from his people. So good, good. Thank you so much for your warm welcome this morning. Thank you for being here. I've got good news for you. Your pastor will be back next Sunday. You only got to put up with me today and Wednesday night. At least nobody screamed out, amen, yeah, you know. <laughs> didn't like that. So bless you, you good people. Thank you. In your Bibles, turn with me over to Psalm 77. We were talking about the Psalms a little earlier this morning. We're going to Psalm 77. If you are here this morning and you are what you might want to call a discouraged Christian in the faith, this Psalm is for you. I want you to listen up. <clears throat> Fact is, we read it. You might think. I could have written that psalm the way I'm feeling in my faith these days. And you're building, you see that the title of the message is, I will remember the works of the Lord. I will remember the works of the Lord. Going to do something a little different this Sunday as opposed to last Sunday. Last Sunday we read the entire text. Oh, first, since we're in the psalm, we're going to take it a piece at a time. And kind of look at it closely. Go on overhead, turn over to Psalm 77, but give me a few moments to lay some groundwork of what we're looking at here. If I was to go around to each of you and speak to you, each of you individually, and ask you, what is your favorite book of the Bible? A lot of you would probably say the Psalms. Many say the Psalms is their favorite book of the Bible. There is nothing like the Psalms in all of human literature. 
This book of Psalms is God's hymn book, God's worship book, God's poetry book, God's treatise of suffering, God's comfort book, God's book on prayer. It is filled with messianic prophecies overflowing with them about our Lord Jesus Christ. There are 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms. That makes it really the largest book in the Bible since it's got the most chapters, Psalms in it. The Psalms deal with every facet of the nature of God. They deal with every situation in human life. What you see in the Psalms, you see deep, dark despair, which we're going to look at this morning in Psalm 77, but also you see rapturous joy. You name it, it deals with all types of human emotion. The Psalms have been sung by God's people from ancient times that began during the times of King David when he they had that old tabernacle and he, before the building of the grand temple by his son, King Solomon, they had the tabernacle and he brought in the Ark of the Covenant that had been around for many, many years. They brought it in and they started worshiping the Lord with those Psalms back in those days. It's recorded back in the Old Testament book of First Chronicles. I want to introduce you to somebody this morning who you might, an Old Testament character that you might not be familiar with. His name is Asaph, if you look with me in Psalm, maybe in your Bible, you see a little word right at the bottom, right below Psalm 77, a Psalm of Asaph. You spell his name, capital A-S-A-P-H. Maybe you're not familiar with him, but we're going to talk about him. It's a Hebrew name. It means he collected. He collected. He collected psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He was a Levite. The Levites, as you remember from the Old Testament times, were the ones that assisted the priests with their daily ministries in the temple. A number of them were musicians, and that's who we have here with Mr. Asaph here. He had been appointed by King David to serve in the tabernacle. Historians said he lived a long life. He lived during the reign of King David, and he also lived during the time of King Solomon, when King Solomon built a grand, beautiful, glorious temple there in Jerusalem many, many years ago. Historians say that he was a very talented vocalist. He liked to sing, like you all like to sing, like we enjoy singing as we sing praises to our Lord. He directed temple choirs. He was what we would call today a minister of music. Historians say, uh, recorded in the scriptures, that he played the cymbals. If you were in the high school marching band, maybe you played the cymbals. You know, you took those two cymbals and crashed them together to make the music always Felt sorry for the people standing right in front of the guy hitting the cymbals. You know, it just scared you to death. It almost sounded like thunder clapping. He played that. But you know, during this long service of Asaph's life in the tabernacle in the temple, during the reigns of King David and King Solomon, he saw the best of the officials around him, and he also saw the worst of the officials around him. Did you know that this Asaph that we're talking about this morning, that he actually composed a dozen of the Psalms we have in this book of Psalms. He composed Psalm 50. He composed also Psalm 73 through 83. We're looking at Psalm 77 today. This coming Wednesday night, we're going to be looking at Psalm 73. So that's your point, your uh, homework assignment. If you come into church Wednesday night, is to study up on Psalm 73 before this coming Wednesday night. So he is credited with a dozen psalms. He's the author of those. Historians and theologians say that he was a man of very disciplined mind. He was very thoughtful. But they say a, a number of his writings, are, are they have a dash of sadness about them. We would use the term melancholy today. And this would kind of flavor his writings. We're going to see that this today as we look at Asaph. So... What I want us to do, let's go to the psalm. As I said, we're going to take portions of it. That's, this is a good way to study the psalms. If you read the entire psalm, you might forget what we're looking at. But if we take bites of it at a time and chew on it, we're going to look at what Asaph has to tell us. Let's begin our reading at verses 1 through 6 here first in Psalm 77. So what we have here is he's writing. You're going to notice that he's depressed. See, I call it he sighed. You know how 
we sigh when we're discouraged or frustrated. Let's read verses 1 through 6. I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. We'll come back and talk about that in a moment. Verse 4. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. In these first ten verses we're looking here, here in this psalm, Asaph is having a king-sized case of introspection. You're going to notice is what you probably noticed these first six verses we read and hear all the first ten. He uses the term I, me, and my a lot, not so much of the names of God. But he's pouring out his tale of woe to God. There is some type of, of trouble that has come upon him. He doesn't say what he is, but he's down in the dumps. And he only can think of himself. Go back to verse 1, I cried out to God with my voice. He even reemphasizes re this, to God with my voice. He gives ear to me, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My, look at verse 2, my hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. Now look at verse 3, this is strong stuff. I remembered God, but I was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. You see the word sealer right at the end of verse 3. That is a Hebrew term that what they would do, the musicians or any others who were conducting these psalms, it was signal for a pause for people to stop and meditate on what had just been spoken or sung. But look at verse 3. He says, I remembered God and I was upset. You know, you think well, a verse like this shouldn't be in the Bible, but here it is. Like I said, the psalms are real life. They deal with the real, raw human emotions. I remembered God and was troubled. Even thoughts of God were causing him pain. The more he, was, he meditates, the more depressed he would get. And am I talking with somebody who's dealing with that today? You're calling on God, Lord, help me, help me. But the more you concentrate on him, the more you ask him, the more... He's just like, God, where are you? You've taken a vacation. You're not listening to me. More down in the dumps you get. And look at verse 4. He says, you hold, you hold my eyelids open. The man was suffering from insomnia. I was so troubled I couldn't speak. Have you ever been so mad that you just stomped your foot and you couldn't say anything? <laughs> well, maybe you quoted scripture that's not in the Bible. You were so mad. Yeah, but don't ask me what those words are. I'm not going to repeat them. No. Have you ever been so mad that you just couldn't talk? That's, that's how what's Asaph's here. Look at verse 4 again. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled, I can't talk. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. Yeah, it's going back in time to what was those good old days. Yeah, we do that. Verse 6, I call to remembrance my song in the night, my music in the night. Remember, Asaph was a talented musician, vocalist, and played the cymbals, great choirs. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit is making diligent search. I mean, we're talking big time introspection here. He's sighing. Now I want you to look at verses 7 through 10. I call this Asaph is sinking. With all this introspection he is doing, look what comes out. Very six, six raw questions in verses 7 through 10. Let's read verse 7. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? They're here again, Selah. 
And I said, this is my anguish, or this is my infirmity, this is my problem, but I remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Let's go back and look at this. Like I said, it helps with these psalms, take them bit by bit, to let them unfold. He's got six huge questions here. Question number one, verse seven, will the Lord cast off forever? God, are you finished with me for good? Anyone here struggling with that today? Second question, he says, and will he be favorable no more? We know him as the God of grace and love and mercy, but he's asking these questions, does God just throw through with me? He's cast me off. Verse 8, has his mercy ceased forever? Oh, the mercy of God. That, that's a big question there. Woe be unto us if the mercy of God should ever stop. Second part of verse 8, has his promise failed forevermore? This book you hold in your hand and I hold in my hand. We all know there are not a lot of explanations in here, but this book is overflowing with the promises of God. So Asaph is asking this question, has his promise failed forevermore? You go to verse 9, has God forgotten to be gracious there's that term graciousness there in the Old Testament. Yes, they dealt with grace there. We all know it's by grace we are saved through faith. The, last question, the second question in verse 9, has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? See, Has God's anger caused him to cut off his flow of compassion? You see the struggles here? I mean, these are raw questions. As I told you, the Psalms are like that. That's why we love them, because they deal with all types of human emotions. They even deal with these raw, despairing emotions. Yes, that even we as Christians can have. God, have you cut me off? Have you pushed me aside? Have you stopped your mercy and your grace and your compassion to me? Now, this is someone who served in the temple. This is someone who knew King David and King Solomon. This is someone who probably knew his Old Testament over the time backwards and forwards, and he's asking these questions. And then in verse 10, he says, and I said, this is my anguish, or he might be uh, translated, this is my infirmity, it's my fault, it's not God's fault. I'm the one that has just walked away from him. Then he mentions, but I'm going to tell you what, maybe I should consider the second part of verse 10, the years of the right hand of the Most High. And then we come to verse 11. And there's a big, big change. Let's read verses 11 through 15 because he starts to singing. He starts to sing in verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Now here in verse 11, we got a spiritual turning point. I mean, he's really been down in the dumps with these first 10 verses. Deep, deep introspection. But what Asaph does, he turns his eyes heavenward. He determines to reflect on God's past interventions of his people when they were stuck in some tight spots at times. That's what we have to do when we find ourselves getting discouraged and depressed. And remember, our adversary wants us to be discouraged and depressed. As we go down and down, we've got to engage the mind and says, look, no, no, no. I'm going to look heavenward. I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up. If you're here today, there's a message to you. Look up. Look up. Keep following what we're talking about here. He said, now we're beginning to see, wait a minute. I see the darkness of my heart. I see my discouragement. But God is holy. God is perfect. God does not make mistakes. He is perfect and righteous and good. 
Back to verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. I, surely I will remember your wonders of old. Verse 12, I'm going to meditate on all of your work and talk of your deeds. He's getting his mind off of himself and onto God and on the works of God, the things he med- He says, I meditate on all of your work. Verse 13, your way, oh God, is in the sanctuary. Remember at this time, the presence of God was always right there at the grand temple where the priests and Levites like Asaph would minister. God's presence were there, and that was so important to the people. God's presence, your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary where you appear, where we gather, where we worship. And notice the second part of verse 13. He says, who is so great a God as our God, he asks. Who is so great a God as our God? You know what, when I was, let me tell you something, this is a God thing, what I'm about to tell you. When I was preparing this, I read verse 13, O oh God, your way, your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God of our God? I thought about, guess what, how, that hymn, How Great Thou Art. What did we do this morning? We sang, How Great Thou Art. The Lord put all this together. Verse 13, O oh, who is so great a God as our God? Verse 14, you are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have redeemed your arm. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and of Joseph. He's talking about the ancient Israelites. What he's doing now, he's going back to talk about that grand event when the ancient Israelites, God took them out of bondage in Egypt back in the book of Exodus. Old Testament scholars would tell you that that is the central core of the book of Exodus when God brought his people out of bondage and slavery out of Egypt to get them going to the promised land. It parallels with us today as Christ Jesus brought us out of the bondage and darkness of sin and leading us into the eternal promised land of the glories of heaven. He's saying, we've got to go back and remember this. So he's beginning to sing. He's beginning to sing here. You have, back at verse 15, I should say verse 14, you are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Joseph and Jacob, my people, his ancestors. You brought us out of that. Time and time again in the Psalms, whoever would compose these different different Psalms, be it Asaph or King David, whoever, many times they would refer back to the Exodus. When God brought his people out of ancient Egypt and and started to lead them toward the promised land. He's remembering that. As you notice now, all the personal pronouns that he was talking about, I, me, my, that he had in the early verses have disappeared. He's saying, you, you, God, you, you're the one that has done all that. Lesson for us, we've got to remember the cross, the coming of the Lord Jesus. God coming down to us in the person of Christ, being born in that manger, living that humble life. But in the last three years of his life, when he turned the age of 30, he went out on an itinerant ministry and proclaimed the kingdom of God to all the people. And, of course, he ended up on that cruel Roman cross, was so horribly executed and was buried, but rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. We today must always look back to that and see That is what I am all about. That is who I am. Faith in this precious Lord Jesus of mine. God came to us in the person of Christ. That was, shall I say it, quote unquote, our exodus. Our exodus from slavery to sin and bondage to Satan. You see, that's what Asaph is doing here. He's remembering that momentous event when God let the people out of Egypt into the promised land. That he got his eyes off of himself. Now, verses 16 and 17. You know, first off, we saw him sighing so in the early part of the book of, uh, of the chapter of Psalm 77. He was sinking down and he was saying, I, me, and by, woe be unto me, and getting more depressed and more depressed. Then he started singing, Look, I'm going to remember the goodness of God and focus on him. 
Now look at verse 16, 16, 17, and 18. This is some of the most beautiful literature in all of the Psalms. Let's read verse 16. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you, they were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Ancient Hebrew language is very vivid in its word pictures. Descriptive. Remember, it was a highly oral society. We still see this in the recorded scriptures. They could just... Describe something you can just imagine in your mind. Look at this here. He, he, this is beautiful literature here. He goes to, 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 with superb literary skill. He pictures the waters of the Red Sea as, as looking up and seeing their creator. Then they retreated in terror. You remember that story when the children of Israel crossed that Red Sea, how God parted the waters and allowed them to cross over dry land to get to the other side. This is happening, and it says all nature is exploding in a violent storm. Torrents of rain are pouring down. Shattering clashes of thunder were going all over the place, and lightning was zigzagging across the sky. A furious whirlwind had come up and blitzed the area, and the countryside was just shaking with this fierce assault, and those waters parted, and God let his people come safely through. Just think about the cross of our Lord. Oh, the darkness that fell. It was so bad that God said, I'm not letting anybody see this, this transaction that is happening when the darkness fell. On Calvary and our Lord was in the dark. You remember there was the earthquake. All nature was convulsing as our Savior was hanging upon the cross. Compare that also with the crossing of the Red Sea back of the ancient Israelites in Exodus. He vividly says, the water saw you, O God, and they retreated. You see, a few verses ago, we, he was so down in the dumps. He was just, he had to lift, reach his hand up just to touch bottom. Now he's soaring with this Language, the water saw you were God. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured water. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. And now look at verses 19 and 20. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses at Aaron. Oh, that's beautiful. Here in verses 16, 17, 18, he just gives this beautiful description. The crossing of the Red Sea by the ancient Israel. And down verse 19, it says, your way, God, you were in the sea. You were in the great waters, but yet your footsteps were not known. My dear friend, if you're discouraged in your Christian faith this morning, let me tell you something. If you're feeling blue and way down, your God is still at work in your life. If you belong to him, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Maybe you don't see the footsteps working, but his heart is there, caring for you. His still small voice is speaking to you. Back at verse 19, the psalmist said, your way is in the sea, in the great waters, but your footsteps were not known. And look at verse 20. He says, you led your people like a flock. And when I see that word flock, I think of the word shepherd. I think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. By the hand of Moses and Aaron, he led him out, going to the promised land of Canaan. He closes on that very sweet personal note, this psalm. The shepherd God leading Israel through the wilderness to Canaan in the care of Moses and Aaron. Oh, discouraged Christian, listen to me this, this morning. Your shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. He understands. He understands. He's walking with you. He's there to encourage you. It may not feel like it. You don't see his footprints. But his spirit can minister to you if you open the door to him. Put deep introspection beside and lift your heads to see. 
We see around us here this time of year the beauty of the nature of all the different colors of the trees. And we're so fortunate to live in an area like this to enjoy this. God's handiwork is all around us, and we see it all around us. Even in a discouraging society like we're living in, God is at work in all of us. The shepherd is still guiding you. He has his rod and his stamp, as the psalmist said, leading you on. I like what one Christian writer said, occupation with self brings distress. Occupation with others brings discouragement, but occupation with Christ brings delight. He has called us to walk with him. And to tie a bow in this package that we just all talked about, I want you to turn with me over to the New Testament in 1 Peter in chapter 2. 1 Peter in chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, going down to verse 9 and 10. Brother, sister in Christ, you discouraged this morning. Listen to these two verses. We're going to end with this. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Remember Peter. Peter denied the Lord. Peter got depressed. You know how Peter was. But yet the Lord redeemed him. He said, go feed my sheep. Take care of my flock. Minister to them. Look at these verses. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You're just not just a priesthood, my folks. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation, his own special people. You are his special person. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. There's a whole sermon there. Don't worry, I'm not going to do the whole sermon thing here. But I'm ending up with this. But look at this. You chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You have direct access to the Father through Jesus. Remember, We've been looking at a passage in Old Testament times where they had to go through the priests and go through all those rituals and ceremonies. I'm glad I didn't live back in those days. They had to dot the I's and cross the T's and all that to come before him and all the sacrifices they had to have at the temple. Jesus nailed all that to the cross. And as the scripture says, you know, when Christ died, the veil in that temple was torn from top to bottom, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. God essentially put his hands on that veil and ripped it apart and said, my people, you can come unto me just like you are. The Asaph didn't have that. That's why we are royal priesthood. We can come, as the writer of Hebrews says, we can come boldly into the throne room of the Lord Jesus to find grace and mercy in our time of need. We are royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. To do what? The second part of verse 9, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Remember ancient Israel, they were called out by God to proclaim his praises because they, God had brought them out of slavery and bondage in Egypt part of the Red Sea for them to cross through and brought them eventually into the promised land so that they could pray, proclaim the praises of the God who brought them out of darkness into light. In verse 10, who once were not a people but are now the people of this living God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Mercy. Remember back a few verses ago in Psalm 77, Asaph was one, has the mercy of God stopped? Has his compassion stopped? And the answer is no, no. It's flowing like a river. 
The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. What we've got to do, folks, as believers here on this temporal earth until he calls us home. He has called us to take up our crosses daily, denying ourselves and following him. There may be aspects of our lives where we've got to apply the cross to it. Crosses are heavy. Crosses are hurt. Crosses are bloodstained. But that is the way God, through Jesus, has called us to walk now in this temporal life by the way of the cross. And you know, bless us heart, the Apostle Paul is said in Galatians chapter 6, but God forbid that I should boast or glory except in what? The cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. It is the way of the cross where we have communion with our Savior. No, this world is not fair. It has never been fair. It will never be fair. It wasn't fair to the Lord Jesus. You think it's going to be fair to us as his followers? Think about our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world in Africa and in Asia and the Far East, Pacific Islands and South America who live under communist regimes and Islamic regimes. Have they been fair with them? Of course not. Any Islamic person who confesses Christ, they are completely ostracized by their family. And their family will try to kill them. Their own family will try to kill them just for receiving Christ as Savior. Right now, folks, in the good old USA, we've got it good, but I wonder how much longer that's going to be. The waters are boiling. We say, even coast, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But it is the way of the cross. That's where we crucify our introspections, our depressions, our discouragement, our despairs. And the cross will make us lift, will lift our heads to see this glorious Jesus who died for us, who gave his life, who now lives in us by his spirit. And whatever may come, we say, Lord, you'll help me through it, whatever it is. What a savior we serve. Thank you, Father, for these times around this Psalm 77. Where we see how Asaph got so discouraged and depressed in his life. But when he looked up and saw your graciousness, your goodness, your holiness, your perfection, he realized the blessings that he had. He realized the ancient history that his people had. He put that aside and blessed you and says, Oh, what a great God we serve. Father, I want to pray for discouraged Christians who are here this morning. Lord, put your hand under their chin and lift their chin up. May they see your beauty, your grace, your mercy, your love that overflows down to them. Lord, we know sometimes circumstances in our lives won't change, but yet we have your strength to guide us through anything we may have to deal with. You are good. You are love. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand up with me this morning. We're going to do a thing just a little bit different. Words are going to be up on the screen, but I'm going to ask Angie if she would just play softly. Folks, we all have burdens. We all have things that are going on in our lives, and we have things that we need to release to God. You can't come up and hold on to it and say, God, take this, take this, take this. We have to say, God, take this. And we let it all have the faith and give up to him. I've always said that there are more Christians that would come to the altar than the people that really need it would come follow up. So I'd like for you to have an invitation while she's playing. And if you need, come to the altar, talk to God about anything in this world. Just come right on.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the message that you sent for us today. Father, I pray that we'll take those words, the words of encouragement and knowing that you're there for us, Father. We listen to your words and we put them in our heart and carry them with us in all our endeavors throughout the week, Father, knowing that in the name of Jesus, the Satan has to flee, that his people will have a peaceful and comforting week and with your power, Father, to be able to get through that. Guide us today, Lord, to keep us safe without harm to ourselves and others, Lord, to get us home with our family and friends and come to you at the next important time in your house. In the name of Jesus, I thank you. And uh, all of you, if you will, uh, make, make your way over and uh, let Pastor Harris know you appreciate him. Thank you so much. Be safe on your way. Until next time, God bless.